Coming up on This Week in Linux, we see a lot of application updates, including Firefox, Vivaldi, OBS Studio, LatteDoc, and much more. In distro news, we've got a lot of info for the next release of Ubuntu, some interesting news about Solus, and releases for some Raspberry Pi-related distros. A prominent Linux gaming company is asking for requests of what games the community wants ported to Linux, and we'll talk about some Linux security news that we saw this week. All that and more on today's episode of This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux GNUs. Before we get started with the show, I just wanted to take a moment to address something. You just heard me say, your weekly source, and that probably prompted some confusion regarding the weekly portion, considering I haven't released a new episode in over a month. I've been working on reformatting the show a bit to make it easier to produce, and I have improved the production requirements, but it still needs a bit more work. But with that said, the weekly part of the show is back, and I look forward to making the show better and better for you each week. This Week in Linux is a podcast that is intended to be a concise rundown or overview of this week's news in the Linux world. But I've had some requests that I'd add some discussions to the show. And I'd like to do that. But rather than changing the format of the show, I've decided that I should instead make a sort of follow-up sister show for discussions. I haven't decided what to call it, or even if it's a permanent thing, but I think it'll be a fun experiment to try. The main show of This Week in Linux will remain a pre-recorded and produced show to be released on Sundays. And this follow-up show will be a live stream where anyone can join in and have a discussion with me about the week's topics. The discussion show will be based on the content of the main show, so anyone who wants to participate will have show notes to check out prior to the live stream discussion. The current plan is to do the live stream at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Sundays starting on August 20th. I chose this time in an attempt to have a time zone that allows for as many people as possible to participate. If you're interested in participating in the live show, please join the Tux Digital Discord server as that is where the conversation will take place. The Discord server is available at tuxdigital.com slash discord. This episode is brought to you by the Linux is Everywhere shirt. It's the shirt I made to celebrate the proliferation of Linux. Linux is so widely spread that it is very likely everyone uses it every day, whether they know it or not. The concept of the design has Tux blended into the background to convey the message. Even if you aren't aware that Linux is there, it probably is. The shirt is available for shipping from North America and from Europe. To start off the show, we're going to talk about app news. First up, Firefox 55 was released this week with a lot of improvements, but most importantly, massive improvements for the performance. Anywhere between three to five times faster, it is an obviously significant improvement, and if you haven't tried Firefox in a a while, you should absolutely give it a shot with Firefox 55. In addition to Firefox 55, Firefox 57 is now available for Firefox Nightly Package. And you can download that as a tarball from the Mozilla website, or you can do it via a PPA. The PPA is not as up-to-date as the tarball is, because the tarball has released a new version every day, or night. And the PPA is updated infrequently, but still significant enough to try out the new versions as they come. Vivaldi 1.11 was released this week. The biggest features to come out of that are an advanced reader mode with a dark theme and a light theme if you'd like. You can adjust the sensitivity of the mouse gestures. And also the ability to control the way a GIF loads in the web page. You now have the ability to disable them entirely so that they don't load except for one frame. Or that they only play one time through instead of cycle over and over. Or, like normal, just have them infinitely loop. And another browser update this week, GNOME Web 3.26, or Epiphany 3.26, gets an update for improved support for the Firefox Sync tool. I'm not 100% sure what the Sync tool from Firefox for Epiphany does. Maybe it's just using the Sync protocol to synchronize Epiphany bookmarks and things like that or if they're integrated together so that you can share bookmarks between the two. I'm not sure. I'll have to test that out. But either way, it's pretty cool that they're using Firefox Sync. Also, they had improvements to the web app mode, which are nice things like disabling the homepage button and web apps and stuff like that. But unfortunately, there are some things that I wish they would do that they haven't. I've submitted some bug reports about some features that would be really good if GNOME Web had. But unfortunately... It's been a couple years now, and 
I don't have much hopes that they're going to actually do that at this point. Next is mConnect, which is a GNOME shell extension to integrate KDE Connect with the GNOME shell. The KDE Connect indicator is an alternative to the mConnect. It's been around for a while, but it doesn't work that well in GNOME shell. It's mostly for other things like Cinnamon and LXDE and things like that. But this seems to be working much better for GNOME Shell, and it's because it's specifically made for GNOME Shell. Now, this mConnect GNOME extension is not an alternative to KDE Connect itself, but rather uses KDE Connect as the backend, so you'll still need KDE Connect. They are promising to make an alternative backend written in Vala slash C in the future, but right now it's using KDE Connect. Next up, OBS Studio, or Open Broadcaster Software, has released a new version version 20 and with it comes a lot of stuff to talk about but let's just talk about the main two things that I think are the most interesting and that's uh, modular user interface allowing you to manipulate the interface however you want move things around resize things like each piece is modular so you can have it exactly how you want your workflow to be which is fantastic because there's certain parts of the workflow that are that's the default workflow that I don't really like and I'm happy to see that they're making it a much a customizable option and the next thing is the Stinger Transitions. And if you're not aware of what a Stinger Transition is, it's essentially a transition with a video file. So, for example, instead of having just a fade from one scene to another, you can now have a video play that creates the transition from one scene to another. Now, OBS is fantastic, and it's completely undeniable. But it is a little complicated, and it certainly has a learning curve in the beginning. So, if you're looking for something that allows you to screen record, but a much more simpler way of doing it, then take a look at the new release of Green Recorder, which is 3.0, and it's, it is a much simpler, much straightforward way of doing it. And with the latest release, they've added a, a way to export your screen recording into a GIF image so you can provide animation GIFs instead of just a video. But you can also have a video as well if you want, including audio attached to that video for like narration. Next up is YouTube DL GUI graphical user interface. They had a version release of 0.4 and that brings a new user interface and one that's really cool is a dynamic format detection. If you choose audio instead of video for example it will choose the best audio format available automatically. You can download this from their website or easily, more easily install the PPA from webupdate.org that is being managed by Andrew of webupdate. Web Update. Andrew does a lot of cool things for PPAs, and it's really nice to have somebody like that that keeps track of packages and provides them even when the official projects don't do that. So I'll have that in linked in the show notes if, you want, if you're interested in that. Atom 1.19 is released. Atom is a text editor based on Electron. Actually, it's the foundation of Electron. But still, the most important thing about this release is easily the fact that there is a big improvement to the responsiveness and the memory usage because they implemented a native C++ text buffer that removes a lot of the weight. They're also making it an asynchronous UI so that it won't that when you save files it won't block the UI so that you can continue using things. So switching from one task to another will become much more smooth. It's still an Electron app, so it's still not the most resourceful and uh, no, nah, okay. It's still an Electron app. But it is much better than it used to be, so that's good. The next application on the docket is Latte Doc. Docket? Yep, anyway. Um, <laughs> the, the This version is 0 0.7 release, and there are way too many things to talk about in this release. It's, it's really awesome, but there are a few that are fantastic that I want to talk about. One is dynamic layouts. You can have different layouts for your Latte Doc, which are updated dynamically without closing application. If you've never heard of this, it's similar to how Ubuntu Mate's interface switcher works, and I've got a link in the cards, or in the link in the description as well, for the video I talked about the interface switcher for Ubuntu Mate. And Plasma has something similar called look and feel themes, but the dock, the dock system here seems to be more uh, uh, robust. They also added in a basic advanced mode, which is now allowing people to use the simple aspects of the of the dock without having to go into the, the massively advanced thing where previously it was just everything at once. So that's nice. It's kind of like adhering to the KDE motto of simple by default, 
powerful when needed. And next on that is the dynamic background. Now this is really cool. It's a nice polish thing that doesn't seem to be that important, but once you start using it, it is really cool. It allows you to have a transparent background for your panel, but when you maximize a window, it will turn that transparent background into an opaque background like a black background so that it like just feels smoother and more polished. So that's really cool and I like I like that. Global shortcuts has been added. So you can do super plus a number to launch something like super one, super two, and that will open an application from the global group section of the latte doc. And there are so many more things to talk about, but I'm just gonna leave it there. You can if you look if you want to look at the rest of the stuff that's been included, the links in the video description and the show notes. And finally, KDE Brooklyn has been declared produ production ready. If you're like me, and the first time you heard what you heard Katie in Brooklyn, you're going, uh, what? What's that? Well, turns out Katie Brooklyn is a chat bridge that syncs conversations between multiple platforms. It's written in Java and currently supports bridging between Telegram, IRC, and Rocket Chat. There are other things that do this usually, but though it's only for one platform at a time. So you'd have a connection between IRC and Telegram, but not a multi-layer connection. So this is interesting because of that, and I look forward to see what other platforms they are planning for for the future. Next up in the show is distro news. First, Rasp and OS. Yeah, Rasp and OS. I think that's what you're supposed to say it like. It is a Android-based distro made for the Raspberry Pi. They released version 7.1.2 for the Raspberry Pi 3. Comes with a Google Apps installed by default. And this version also adds support for Google Play Store, which it previously did not have the ability to do. So this is interesting to have an Android-based distro for the Raspberry Pi. Also for the Raspberry Pi 3 and 2, Rasp X Linux brings Ubuntu 17.04 with the LXDE desktop and with a custom compiled kernel 4.9.41 Xton V7. I don't know the difference between the regular kernel version and their compi their custom compiled kernel. Next up is Tails 3.1. Anonymous OS has released. And included with it is the Tor Browser 7.0.4, the Linux kernel 4.9.30, and it has fixed a bug pertaining to erasing data in Thunderbird's temporary directory. Then Gparted Live has been released of 0 0.29. This version supports the UDF file system and updates the kernel to 4.11 via Debian SID. The next distro news is Solus is getting Ubuntu Snap packages. Ike revealed on the snapcraft.io forum that he'll be patching SnapD for Solus. So the issue of application availability on Solus may become a thing of the past thanks to the support for flat packs and now Snaps. I'm not sure if app images are also supported, but they probably are, and I will test that later just to confirm. Red Hat has released Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.4 and has also required the assets and technology of Permabit Technology Corporation. This will improve data du duplication, deduplication, that's fun to say, compression and thin provisioning for RHEL. And finally, this week, Ubuntu 17.10 announced that they're going to have a Wayland session by default, a visible dock, dash to dock, but not all features are going to be included, but dash to dock will be, will be included by default. They'll be moving their buttons of the window buttons back to the right instead of the current left. And they are also doing a fit and finish hack fest in London on August 24th. So anyone who is a developer or a designer for specifically CSS that they, they pointed out, if you'd like to come to the London offices for Canonical on August 24th, they will be having a hack fest or development sprint on that day. And finally for Ubuntu, they announced that Git Ubuntu clone is going is a snap available where you can use Git Ubuntu as a command to clone the sources of any package in the repo of the Ubuntu repos. So that is an interesting way of getting sources. Next up in the show is Linux events. Wrapping up today is DebConf 2017. They're going to have videos posted online at debian.net. So if you're interested in checking out the talks from DebConf, you can go to the show notes of the video of this episode, and I'll have a link to those videos. 
Also, Guaya Deck 2017 took place last week, but this week they actually today just released videos for all the talks at the Guaya Deck conference. And finally, there is some news that the North American Open Source Summit is going to have actor Joseph Gordon Levitt to speak on art and the internet. The Open Source Summit is taking place in September. So if you're interested in checking out the conference, there's a link in the show notes for tickets. In gaming news this week, Feral Interactive announced on Twitter that they want requests for which games that they should port next to Linux from the community. They're accepting comments on Twitter, Reddit, and Facebook. Links are in the description below. Witcher 3 is currently a very popular game that's being requested, and I too would totally like to see that happen. Speaking of Witcher 3, Wine 2.14 was released, which includes improvements for The Witcher 3 and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Finally in Linux gaming, SteamOS 2.121 was released, adding Flatpak support and upgrading the Linux kernel to 4.11.12. But just to be clear, the Flatpaks are related to existing Flatpaks being supported in SteamOS and are not at all related to games being released as Flatpaks. In fact, in a forum post, a representative of Valve said that they are definitely not working on making games released as Flatpaks. Finally this week is Linux security. And the first story is Amazon Echo was, t- was hacked and al- to allow continuous remote eavesdropping. This is not actually a big deal because it's very unlikely that an attack would be successful on anyone in particular because of the way it's structured and what you need to do in order to get it. But I just wanted to put this in there because it is possible for someone to have owned an Amazon Echo and then hack it themselves and sell it as a used Amazon Echo out. So if you're looking into purchasing a used Amazon Echo, you need to be wary that this is a possibility before you purchase it. And finally, Git, SVN, and Mercurial open source version control systems received an update for critical security vulnerability. If you have one of these versions control systems installed on your computer, then you should absolutely update it as soon as possible. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe for more Linux good news. If you'd like to support the channel, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash tuxdigital, or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt, as that also supports the channel. Thanks for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.